Hello and welcome to the first access chat of a brand new shiny decade. It's not just Happy New Year, it's Happy 2020, Happy New Decade. So we're in the uh, roaring 20s now. So get out your <laughs> flap addresses and, and make sure that uh, we we do all of the hedonistic things that you've always wanted to do. Um, talking of hedonism and uh, you know things that are creative and uh, really you know out there. Poetry is one of those things. I'm delighted today to welcome Dave Steele, who is the blind poet. So, Dave, you've um, you've been uh, writing about poetry since what 2014? Is that right? Around you discovered that you had retinitis yeah. pigmentosa around that time. Absolutely, that's when I was diagnosed. Um, it was April 2014 when I was first diagnosed with RP, and I started writing the poetry at the end of that year uh, with regards to everything that I was going through uh, in sight loss. Okay, uh, um, um, how how did you, did you write before? Did, uh, were, I, I did English so, and history. I, I wrote some very bad poems, and I studied <laughs> poetry quite a bit. But um, you know, I, I, uh, where did you discover your talent? Was it something that you already had that you returned to? Yeah, kind of. I worked as a singer uh, all of my life uh, for the best part of 20 odd years beforehand when I was, you'll relate to this being this from the UK, when I was 18 and I left college I wanted to work in entertainment, I'd always wanted to be a singer from the moment I could really talk and sing and love music and I went away and worked at the Holiday Park so it was a blue coat for a company called Pontins which I'm sure you'll be familiar with and I went and worked away, yeah. I, did tour, I was a touring cabaret, I sang on uh, cruise ships and hotels abroad, uh, you know, uh, different uh, locations across uh, the UK and Europe. And so music and poetry were the same thing to me. I'd written some songs previously, N not really any, any volume of songs, but um, a few songs and a few poems when I was younger. But it wasn't up until I was diagnosed with RP in April um, 2014, uh, at the end of that year when I was really struggling when I started to turn to poetry and began to write about everything uh, um, that I was going through. Uh, and, 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 and you've, you've, um, you've written a book of poetry, is it Stand By Me RP, is correct? Yeah, three, well, right? three books now. So, so wow. basically the way it came okay. about was, when I was diagnosed with RP in April 2014. I went for a routine eye test. I knew that had we had RP in my family. So for those of people that are out there that don't know anything about RP or retinitis pigmentosa, as it's called, it's a hereditary condition, so it runs in the family. Uh, the particular gene type that we have in my family, there's a one in two chance every time uh, of it being developed. So it's, it's what they call a dominant type of RP. So it comes from my mum's side. My sister was the first person to be diagnosed with it, and my mum is now completely blind with it. And I was told I was told that um, it wouldn't affect me until I was an old man, until I was in like my 60s or something. Uh, when my sister was first diagnosed with it at a hospital in Moorfields, uh, called Moorfields in London, which is now one of the sort of leading eye hospitals in the world. In the early 80s, she was told, you have this thing called RP, um, you're probably going to go blind, it's hereditary, so don't have any kids. And that's pretty much all she was told. There's no treatment or cure, that's it. There wasn't much information. So when I first heard about it, as I said, I didn't think it was going to affect me. I probably had the early onset of RP in my early 20s, but it was a very gradual loss. Now, the way people lose the sight with RP is, for those of you who don't know, it starts off with night blindness. So struggling from light to dark places. So, for example, a normal person work, uh, walking from a lighted environment into maybe like a cinema, it'll take them a couple of seconds for their eyes to adjust. Uh, for someone with night blindness, uh, their eyes won't adjust. So when I was in my early 20s, I probably had the first sort of stages of night blindness. The next stage after that is you tend to lose your peripheral vision. So like a tunnel going inwards, that's why they call it tunnel vision. And then you lose your central vision last uh, to, to then you can't recognize faces. So I um, used to get myself checked every couple of years just to make sure that I was still OK for driving and things like that. And when I was 38, nearly six, well, six years ago now, I walked into a routine eye test and they looked in the back of my eyes and they said, you know, look, the pigment is really, really thick at the back of your eyes. You need to stop driving straight away. I um, I'd only just got engaged. Myself and my fiance were planning to get married the following year. 
we just had a son together who was six months old and I had to walk out and tell my you know my future wife that um, I was no longer able to drive I told my work um, they let me go I lost my job uh, I have a daughter who lives in Glasgow by a previous relationship so I couldn't drive and get her for the weekend once wow. a month as I was doing you know driving three and a half hours to Scotland um, one weekend every month and um, things got really really tough for a while we applied uh, for all the support that was out there things like personal independence payment now that's the main kind of benefit support here in the UK for, for someone with a disability and when I applied for it um, after I was diagnosed that April in 2014 there was a nine month waiting list before you received a payment and before you got assessed so for nine months as a family we were in limbo uh, and unfortunately with the situation we were in we couldn't afford the rent in the house we were staying in at, at the time um, so we lost our house we had to feed our kids on food parcels because we, we we couldn't afford while we were waiting for these kind of things the support network to come through we tried everywhere and it was a real struggle and all the while I was um, my sight was declining um, quite rapidly. I, I lost all my peripheral in the first, I think it was about the first six, seven months. And I was really struggling with anxiety and depression, not only for the sight that I was losing, but for the financial pressure I was putting on my family. So my sister, who I said was the first one to be diagnosed, had advised me to go on to social media, some of the support groups on the likes of Facebook, to speak to people who were going through the same kind of thing as me. Uh, because when you diagnose with these types of conditions these days, it's quite often done in a very cold clinical environment. You're told, you know, what the condition is, what the effects are, and that's pretty much it. You might be given a card for a support network or whatever, uh, and a lot of people tend to slip through the net. So my sister advised me, because I was struggling with how quickly I was losing my sight, to speak to people online, which I did. I went on, joined some of these support groups, and then through that, I got asked um, to attend a meeting in Newcastle in the UK uh, for people with RP and Usher syndrome, which is deaf blindness, same sight loss, but with hearing loss. And when they heard I was going to be attending, they'd heard I was a singer and they said to me, you know, oh, would you would you be our entertainment for the day? Would you come and sing for us at the, uh, the support meeting? So I was like, yeah, sure, I'll do that. Because for me, that was where I felt comfortable uh, on stage or in front of a crowd and audience is my kind of comfort zone. It was other things like going out you know, struggling with low vision in a busy place and holding on to my 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 son's pram because I was feeling anxious. That was the things that I'd get nervous about. So when they asked me to sing, I was like, yeah, absolutely. So the night before the event, I was in bed with my wife and she was trying to get to sleep. And I had this idea where I thought if I could take a song that everyone knew, but change the words so it would have more of a, a an emotional response, more of an impact when I sang it. So I chose the song Stand By Me by Benny King. You know, you're just referring to there because I like yep. the opening line of when the night has come and the land is dark and the moon is the only light we'll see because that was like night blindness to me. So yeah. within, 20, within 20 minutes, I rewrote the song because, as I said, music and poetry is the same thing. It's lyrics. And I rewrote the song and then performed it the following day. And then I was completely kind of overwhelmed with the impact people would were saying to me after I sang it they were in tears and they were saying that I was able to describe how they'd always felt about their journey with sight loss but they weren't able to find the words themselves so that's where the poetry came from and that's why the books and everything else going forward was called Stand By Me RP because it came from that song I released it onto YouTube it kind of went viral um, and then I started writing poetry every day sometimes two or three a day um, just to try to get it out of my system of what we were going through, but also getting those messages back from people saying it was helping them was giving me, um, well, put it this way. I always say that when I started to lose my sight, I went through a lot of the things that people tend to go through with those sort of diagnoses. I, I, I lost my confidence. I lost my independence through my low vision. But the biggest thing it kind of took from me was my purpose. I didn't know what I was going to do next. So when I was at my lowest and I found these words that were helping people, that then sort of went, OK, well, I can do this. So that's when I started to write every day to the point now, six years later, I've written over 700 poems and three books. Wow. So, Dave, I, I know that um, I, I was very honored to um, have you on my show, Human Potential at Work, and I sure. thought, well, you do definitely need to be on Access Chat. But thank you. I know I know we talked about this a little bit on my program, but um, 
the the comment that was made to your sister don't have kids yeah, I know that uh -huh. has been a very powerful part of your journey. And of course, how ridiculous are we saying don't have kids because if, you know, your child might go blind in the future and that's mm -hmm. not so they don't even deserve to live. I mean, yeah, there's so I mean, many. That's just ridiculous. It's so ridiculous because uh -huh. being blind is I, I had a friend of mine that was blind say it is it's not a tragedy. It's an inconvenience. It's an inconvenience. We all have different so, challenges. Yeah, and so what does that say to you as a father? Because don't have kids, but you have kids. And I know well, that you've yeah. written a beautiful poem for your daughter, and you're going to give uh, us yeah, some so poems. Well. But I, I was just wondering if you would talk a little bit about what that does to your head for a doctor, because they're experts, right? It's to yeah. tell well, your sister not to have kids. Yeah, well, when, when you know, when I was – diagnosed my, my sisters said you know she, when she was diagnosed it was in the early 80s and they, they didn't really have a lot of information there nowhere near where they're up to now things have moved on you know a lot um so when i was diagnosed um nearly, nearly six years ago now i knew that there was um a, a, a chance of my children possibly having rp when they're older but i didn't know what the chances were that information wasn't around back when my sister was diagnosed so i once i was declared uh what they call severely sight impaired here in the uk which is legally blind i uh, then had to go for uh, genetic counseling as they call it ge genetic testing where they take a sample of blood and then so many months later i think it was about four to five months we got the results through and myself and my wife as she was at the time there amy uh, or she is now she, she's, she's not gone she's still here she's in the kitchen um she um we we had to sit in a in a doctor's waiting room and, and find out for the first time that our son who was who had just turned one at the time um had a one in two chance of going blind when he was older and same with my daughter you know who is now 12 um and you know that was we didn't know that it was a one in two chance i had people you know would say to me online oh well you know if i'd have known that i wouldn't have had kids and it's like, you, you can't, you know, you, you can't plan for things like that. Um, we didn't know. And I, I wouldn't change him for the world. And and that's part of the thing that inspire you know, that inspires me to do what I do now. It's it's I want to show my son, Austin and my daughter, Ellie, all the things that you can do despite any challenges in life, despite any limitations. It shouldn't stop you with accessible technology and all of the support that's out there these days, how lucky we are. In the world now with everything that we've got um there's there's no reason you can't go on and do amazing things in your life and that is the thing that really drives me on to do what i do and support other people yeah it, it's it's sort of chilling to think that people think it's better to not ever be born than someday it, maybe become blind in your life it, it's i've it's been on trains before chilling. when i've heard that conversation that conversation's wow. happened in front of me where I've had two people sat on the seats next to me and they've said, you know, oh, I'd rather be dead than blind. And I'm like, I'm right here. I'm not dead. Oh, my God. Oh, my that's, God. That's, that, that is, it's commonplace that those things do happen. It's just it's, chilling. It's, it's, I know I'm telling like, you. Yeah. Go, go ahead, Dave. <laughs> No, I was just going to say, kind it's like, kind of like that thing. You ever see where, you know, you have like in a TV show, it's a, you know, things like Friends, for example, where there'll be a conversation going on one side of the room and you've got people in the background and they're about two foot away, but apparently no one can hear. <laughs> it's almost like they think it's like that. They're, they're, they're sat two foot away from you saying these things. It's like, I'm, you know, I'm right here. Wow. I know Antonio has a question. Let me turn the mic to him. Sure. Uh, there, there are so many life conditions that you know that you can't predict in life from, from an accident. So that's it's so it just you know people cannot just you no know, life is is not perfect. It will never be. Uh, so what I wanted to ask is about uh, when you started to look at channels in social media to know more uh, mm -hmm. and to get in touch with other people. How valuable were you able to find that information? Very valuable um, with regards to initially uh, you know, the majority of things I was hearing because there's a lot of, with something like retinitis pigmentosa, there's still a lot unknown about that condition. Uh, the um, retinal specialists and everyone in that kind of field 
uh, will only look at it from a very clinical kind of background. So I, when I speak to people all over the world, as I, as I have been able to do through social media, people will say that they suffer with certain, not suffer, if they have certain symptoms um, due to their, their retinitis pigmentosa, um, for example, uh, a low energy, uh, feeling lethargic uh, late on in the day. And a lot of people say they all suffer, you know, they all have this low energy um, because of their RP, but then you'll say to uh, a specialist about it, oh, you know, is that related? And they say, no, it's not. Um, but it is, but for different reasons. You know, with things, with, 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 for example, with the low energy that I was just talking about, the way that comes into play is where the retinal specialists don't see it is because uh, I've got a very small tunnel of vision. So just to show you where I where, what I can see at the moment is my left eye. I can't see out of at all. That's completely blurred now. And my right eye is pretty much just like looking through a straw. So when I'm going about my day to day business uh, using a cane or using my guide dog or just getting around, I have to scan um, a lot to, to see where I'm going because I have no peripheral vision. Um, and it's almost like the same kind of energy someone would use driving a long distance, you know, because you have to concentrate when you drive in and you, you, when yeah. you drive, sat down for like four hours, you feel very tired. For someone with low vision, because they're having to concentrate so much more than a, full, a fully sighted person just to get around and do simple tasks, it tends to wipe you out. So things like that, I wouldn't have known about. Um, if I hadn't spoke to other people, I would have thought that I was the only one. And still to this day, when I speak to people around the world, things like headaches through light, light um, sensitivity and things like that, they'll speak to specialists and they'll say, oh, it's not related to the condition, but we all have it. So getting to speak to people who were going through the same things, not just physically, but emotionally as well, was a massive, massive support to get me where I needed to be. No, it's so quite I think that's really interesting. Go on, Hunter, okay. No, that the the doctors are saying the one thing is not related when no that's part of your you no know, your social life and your daily activities require uh, are the ones and your condition are the ones creating your situation so it's actually related so yeah it's just, absolutely is this the question of you know the doctors are looking that that from a clinical perspective but there's mm -hmm. also the social aspect that needs yeah. to be incorporated on, on, on the way how they look at the person that they have in front of them. There's, there's, there's one more thing that um, I was talking about this with Deborah um, just over a week ago, uh, that a lot of people, even with um, of sight loss, don't realize. And, and that is something that's related specifically to a retinal disease like mine. Because the retina is basically something that uh, uh, sends you know, see, sees what the eyes are seeing and then sends the signal to the brain for the brain to, you know, to, 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 to um, I've, I've the words, it's a, to be, I've, I've lost the word, you process? know what I'm going to say. It's a process, yeah, process. To, base, to basically process it. Um, and my retinas don't work properly. One of the, the weirdest things it does, and this is where a lot of the anxiety comes from for people with low vision. If I am in an open environment like a park where there's not a lot of, uh, moving objects and it's quite quiet I can feel like I could see almost like a normal fully sighted person but then if I turn a corner and there's a lot of moving objects for example people or cars or whatever my retinas can't deal with that picture and it becomes almost mixed up and then I go completely blind within a split second and that can be one of the most anxious things about living with um, something like RP is the fact that I could literally, you know, feel as if I'm seeing OK and then turn a corner and then I go completely. It's almost like being fogged over. Um, but it's because the retinas can't um, interpret the signal. It's like, you know, if I'm watching a film, I can't watch now. I can't watch fight scenes in superhero films because once there's a lot of moving objects and it starts moving quite quickly, my eyes can't deal with it and I go completely fogged over. So a lot of people, when you think about blindness and low vision, will think either, like a lot of the misconceptions, you're either completely blind or you're not at all, or you only see one way the entire time. And that's not the way. Um, with a lot of people with low vision, there's a lot of different things that affect how I see. The objects that we're just talking about that are in front of me, it could be 
the weather, the light, um, how I'm feeling if I'm ill. You know, if, if I'm, you know, feeling, if I've got the flu, my eyes aren't great. Uh, and I'll have bad days of stress as well. You know, if I'm stressed, that affects my vision as well. So there's lots of different factors that will, uh, will affect it. Yeah, that makes t total sense. And, and I think it's often the case that, um, that the medical profession focus purely on the the causality and the pure medical symptoms they don't think about the impacts and the side effects of the conditions and the 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 other impacts that the the, the knock on effects of a lot of conditions that that affect the rest of your life and 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 you know i i've got quite a number of friends that have rp and they're all reporting exactly the things that you you talk about you know the tiredness the the effort that it takes to be concentrating and everything else um, i would say it's constantly adjusting that's the hardest yeah. part is the constantly adjusting yeah. and 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 i think that that i i can empathize to a certain extent because being dyslexic and, and, and ADHD, there's an, an awful lot of effort taken in, in focusing. And also when I'm trying to read, you know, keeping stuff, you know, keeping my, my focus on that. And, and yeah, you, you, you get tired and it becomes harder to do this stuff when you're tired. It's easier to, to read a page of, of, of text in the morning than it is in the, in the evening when, I, you know, when I've, I've had a, a long day. So I, I totally get the, the, the whole sort of cognitive load that you're getting. But I, I, it was interesting to hear about the, the processing part. I think that's, yeah. that's really, um, that, that, that makes a lot of sense to me because I, I, I totally understand, you know, how your brain needs to process stuff and, and, you know, what you see is not what you see. For example, you know, I have quite a prominent nose. It's quite large, right? I, I'm, but I don't I'm really see there. my own nose. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, I don't, but because your brain filters mm -hmm. out your nose when you have binocular well, vision. The other thing with that as well is, um, and, and this is a, a really scary part that I speak to a lot of people about is, um, when you walk into a room, your brain uh, subconsciously scans that room. And for someone who maybe have uh, not perfect vision, it tends to fill in the blanks for what your eyes can't see. So there's a lot of people, and I, I, I especially get this when I speak to people in America, who will say to me, oh, um, I'm, 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 I'm suffering with night blindness now because of RP, uh, so I don't drive at night anymore, but I drive in the daytime, which is very different here. And But they don't realize that um, they probably think they can see more than they actually can, and it's not until their eyes are tested in a proper clinical environment that, you, you, the, that they actually realize that, oh my God, I'm at actually a lot blinder than I thought I was. There was a bus driver who was actually sent to prison in Ireland a, a few years back who had Usher syndrome. He was deaf blind and he was driving a bus because he thought that um, he could see more than he actually could and he ended up killing his passengers. Um, but go, going back to what you were saying there about the clinical environment thing, uh, and I'm sure you'll appreciate this. I, I I speak about this a lot now. I think that it's the it's not it's the most difficult bit, a part of living with low vision for me personally, other than the hereditary side of things for my children, is the misconceptions. It's not so much the physical um, limitations of my low vision. It's the um, lack of education and and lack of um, or, or the amount of misconceptions that are out there about blindness um, that are the things that really hold people back. People say to me, I'm not blind enough yet to use a cane. I'm not blind enough yet to use a guide dog. And, and I'll say to them, you know, why do you think that? And they say, well, you've got to look a certain way to, to you know, you've got to have a certain level of sight loss to use a cane or use a guide dog. You've got to be completely blind to use a guide dog. And I say, well, look, you know, do you find yourself not going out to certain places because of your vision? Do you find yourself staying in more and becoming more isolated because, you know, you don't go to certain places because maybe it's too dark or too busy? And they'll say, yeah. And I'll say, well, you're ready then. But because they don't fit into this perceived box of what blindness looks like, as we mm. just talked about, they become needlessly isolated and and, and stay in more and, and won't use the, the the aids and mobility aids and tools that are out there for them because they're scared of what other people think. 
and yeah. especially guys as well. Guys are really, um, are, 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 are really perfect for this. You know, I speak to a lot of men all over the world who say, you know, I, I don't want to use a cane because I feel like I'm going to be seen as vulnerable or a target or less of a man. And, and that's not the case at all. No. Uh, it's, it's actually, you know, you're actually more of a man and stronger for getting out there and saying, you know, this is what I need to do it, but it's not going to stop me. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I, I'm very, very, yeah, absolutely. Uh, my, my own father didn't want to accept that whole piece. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think it's, it's really, it, it is a generational thing. Um, having worked with the sisters tech for the last 20 years, I'll be taking everything that's on off yeah, when it absolutely. comes to me, right? Absolutely, same. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to grasp it, but 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 there is this whole thing about you know not being disabled enough. You know, at what point? You know, am I? You know, because you know, especially when it's um, you know cognitive. You know, you know, it's like, do I qualify? Yeah. Uh, you know, do, you know, do I do I have a right to speak about this stuff? You yeah, know, am the, I part the of the community or am I not? Yeah, yeah, it's, the, the it's, system it's has a lot to difficult. do with that. Yeah, yeah, the the system unfortunately um, makes people, especially here in the UK, makes people have to um, really, you know, um, prove their disabilities more than they should have to. And 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 that's that's not fair. Uh, I've I've been a big campaigner since uh, since I went through it myself of of you know trying to find out why it shouldn't be so simple as if if a doctor registers someone as legally blind, then automatically they should get the support that's needed and not have to prove it to someone who doesn't know anything about sight loss, as you have to do with personal independence payment and things like that. Uh, the horror stories that we we've all heard out there from these kind of things and it's not just the uk it's all over um where people have to you know um prove a disability um when they shouldn't need to you know it, it's about supporting the right people in the right way and um and yeah you know it should, it should, we should never have to do that um and, and and that is another thing that kind of it has inspired me to do what i do now and write the things that i write because it's not only about supporting people and their families who are going through the same kind of thing that I've gone through, but also creating more awareness and, and saying that you don't look blind. You know, you, no one looks blind. You don't have to look a certain way to have low vision. Talking about invisible disabilities, um, which is obviously a massive thing these days now. And, you know, we're starting to pay attention a little bit more. Dave, I know that you are a world famous uh, poet now and you have gone tours all over the world and recently you've done um, one in the US and you're coming back to the US and I was hoping that you might um, share some of your poems. You shared a poem after we went off air that you wrote for your daughter, um, which actually made me tear up and I was wondering just selfishly if you would share that one and then maybe you can share another one. But I think that there's so much I love about your story, but I know that you had said that when you had come, you also had told a story on air um, where there was um, a gentleman that came to yeah. uh, one of your readings. And I don't, and it, it, I, I hope you're remembering which, which one I'm talking no, about. Course, yeah, but, yeah. You know, he was, yeah, and I just thought it, that one really, so much of your interview with you uh, really touched my soul and so i was wondering if you would talk about that gentleman and maybe uh, do the poem that you wrote for your daughter and uh, maybe one more too if you don't mind sure yeah <laughs> well going back on on, on the, the gentleman we were just talking about who's called derek um I, i'm a great believer i was talking about this earlier today with, with with someone that came to see me how everything happens for a reason and the things that we go through in our past give us the ability to do things going forward. A great believer in that. For example, you know, I spent um, a bit of time when I was in my formative years, uh, early 20s, when I was working as a singer. We're talking about me working at uh, Pontins uh, in the UK, uh, which was seasonal work. So you'd work in the summer and in the winter time. Um, th there wasn't any work until the summertime. It was only like, you know, you, you get a little bit of work at Christmas, but then like January, February, there was no work until like the start of the summer again. So I didn't have a family home. And uh, when I was working places, uh, I'd go all over the world and work as a singer. But then when I didn't have uh, any work, I had nowhere to live. Uh, so there was times where I ended up homeless. 
there was um you know i i was there was times when i have attempted suicide uh, when i was younger i was electrocuted working away on stage uh, actually electrocuted through a microphone when i was singing and uh, was on a life support machine for a couple of weeks with an irregular heartbeat so got scars from it and um really didn't deal with that and ended up uh, trying to take my life a couple of times and uh, and pulling myself forward uh with all the work that i've done with my singing you know that gave me the ability to write the poetry and and all these tests that I've had in my past have made me stronger and and shown me what's important in life. So when it came to me with my diagnosis with low vision, it didn't take me long for my my that thing inside me that kicks in when I feel as if I'm at bottom to say, you need to keep going, Dave. That that resilience in me kicked in because of all those things that I'd done. And, you know, when it got to writing the poetry when it all started spilling out of me when i started to write every day sometimes two or three a day i knew that i was on i knew that i would found my purpose again i knew that there was a reason that i was doing this everything that i'd done before had given me the ability to write what i was doing and talk about the things that i was able to talk about to be able to connect with people uh through these words so coming to america i i came to america as I said in in october november time and the response there at every one of my readings speaking at big events for charities and and doing some corporate events where i was motivational speaking and talking about my story hearing that response from people who had low vision and could connect with my words but then also seeing people who have no um experience of low vision or don't know anyone who's affected by blindness close their eyes and put themselves in my position was an amazing experience to have and it's like that at every event that i do with that response that i get but the um the, the incident that um uh, that deborah was just talking about there i was doing an event in rhode island at rhode island college and i did a, like an hour presentation did a q a and then was doing some book signings and there was a a, a guy in the room in his late 20s early 30s and he looked, there was something about him he looked out of place there was something about him that was drawing my attention to to him and eventually he was he was looking at me he was kind of nervous and he comes up while i'm signing some books and i introduced myself i said you know hi what's your name he said oh my name's derek I said, dave pleased to meet you i said what brings you here today and he said to me he said um i was just diagnosed with rp on monday and this was wednesday and i was like oh okay so I said, look, I'm really, really sorry to hear that. I said, can you just do me a favor? Just come and sit with me at this table here. And I took him away from where there was a queue of people and I sat him down at the side so we could just talk. And I said, look, you know, it's it's only been five years for me at the time. I said, I remember how it feels. I said, how are you doing? You know, tell me, tell me your story. So he turned around, he said, look, he said, you know, it was only a couple of days ago, but I, I went into um, an eye test. I thought I had cataracts and they looked in the back of my eyes and they said, I have RP. Um, that uh, I'm probably going to go blind and it might affect my children. Do you have any kids? And he said, yeah, I've got three. So he'd pretty much been left like that while he was waiting for another appointment. He'd gone home and I said, you know, how have you been feeling? He said, oh, you know, and this is me getting upset now thinking about it. He said, um, I'd been in tears one minute, angry the next, going through all that kind of, all those stages of loss in a very short period of time. And he went online to research RP, and one of the first things he found was one of my poems. And when he read it, it struck a chord with him. And then he was in work that Wednesday, and his wife called him, and she said, you're never going to believe this, but Dave Steele's in America. And not only is he in America, he's in Rhode Island. And this guy walked out of his work, jumped in his car, and drove an hour straight to come and see me. He was like, I just need to go and meet him. And he, he just came to see me and I was just like, oh, my God, I, I literally goosebumps just standing up um, as soon as he said that. I was thinking, what are the chances of him being there or me being there two days after his diagnosis when he just found one of my poems and it's helped in that way? It's It was crazy. Um, but that's the power of music and that's the power of poetry. We've all had a, maybe a, a song that's gotten us through a teenage heartbreak when we were younger and things like that. And, you know, and having the power of social media where you can just click a button, write something, because I've written over 700 poems now. None of them have taken me longer than 20 minutes, uh, because if it's not flowing from the heart, it's not worth writing. You click a button, send it around the world. And for someone maybe having a bad day, sat in a darkened room somewhere, you can say to them, you're not alone. 
someone else knows exactly how you feel and don't worry it's mm -hmm. going to be fine and that's that's just a, a you know a gift that i found at my lowest and uh, I, you know I, I i i just feel totally blessed that i've been able to do this and get, and, and able to reach more people with the help of yourselves as well um Dave, so do you want to i will yeah we, 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 yeah we've we've reached pretty much the end of our allotted time so if you want to do the poem and then and, and then we'll close that would be great yeah, we, we definitely want to do the we poem. definitely want the poem yeah, yeah. this poem i wrote for my daughter who's now 12 she's called ellie um she lives in glasgow and with there have been a one in two chance um that she could lose her sight when she was older i wrote i wanted to write a poem about when's the right time to have that conversation when's the right time to tell her about something like that um because it's a it's a tricky conversation to have especially with someone that you don't live with every day and this one's called the secret it took me years to come to terms with how my eyes declined through stages of acceptance of slowly going blind but nothing i could ever do would allow me to prepare to tell my little girl a thing i still don't want to share it's tortured me through sleepless nights consumed my mind with guilt this secret i have kept from her could break the trust i've built i pray that she will understand the things i've tried to do and why i never told her that she could be one in two for she is still a child and far too young to burden with a fate that i might pass to her for now is her time to live but soon will come a moment when i know she must be told when all the battles i have won i'll pass for her to hold but for every unheard question there's an answer i've prepared they're written in each line each verse each poem that i've shared for every page i've filled i've emptied out my heart and soul so one day she would know the way that's always been my goal so ellie i hope years from now you'll be there reading this no you can do amazing things whether rp hit or miss my inheritance to you won't be a passed down faulty gene but knowing all life's beauty that this vip has seen fantastic beautiful so beautiful <clears throat> and before before we turn it over to neil to close will, will you mm. tell will you just tell the guest what your website is so i mean you have three books yeah you're, you so, tour you do corporate events you, you know are available I, I love your work dave i love you thank work. you very much now i really appreciate it you know um yeah so the books are called stand by me rp uh stand by me rp uh and then there's volume two and there's volume three uh which are all available on amazon um we didn't call stand by me rp volume one because we didn't think there was going to be a volume two <laughs> uh the the website is called theblindpoet.net which is just about to launch theblindpoet.net um it's available at the moment but we're just launching it officially next week when i'm out in america and uh, all the details on there about booking me for events uh for corporate and coming come to read poetry and and speak and tell my story and and reach more people uh is all through the website there so um hopefully you know anyone that wants to come and hear me speak a bit more can reach out you have beautiful Fantastic. work and it's not just for people with rp it's for all of us no certainly Go not ahead, you know anyone that goes yeah. through anxiety depression you know ptsd things like that most people can relate to things in there yeah life yeah absolutely thank you thank you dave so i, I also need to thank you know, our supporters that that keep us uh, going and we're in our soon to be sixth year of uh, Access okay. Chat now. Particularly Amazing. need to thank and congratulate uh, Barclays Access and, and Paul Smythe on his OBE. Uh, fantastic to see recognition for all of the work that Paul's done. Well done, Paul. Um, thank uh, NASA, Siabi, OBE from Microlink. It's a bit of a theme going on here. We need mm. OBEs from MyClearText next. Um, but all three organizations help us be more accessible and, and get the message out so uh really want to thank them for the continued support in this new decade and thank you dave it's been a real pleasure talking with you a real pleasure to be on here thank you very much thank you <laughs>